In the 70s, with the inrush of cheap components, for the radio hobbyist, it was it was it was Christmas every day. A store that was became my new mecca was Truscott Electronics, and um, they had an enormous store just based in Croydon behind the main street. Of course, there were the professional companies. Always had been the George Browns and the radio parts and such as that. It was like a small supermarket, but full of surplus electronics parts. And Dick Smith, of course, is one that came up, he started finding he could sell components. And it's when he converted Dick Smith car radios to Dick Smith electronics that he made it, all the parts freely available for us. That accelerated quite the people like myself in the getting into the industry. But this was the period, of course, when you would buy all the little individual components. You would buy all your logic chips from Dick Smith's or some of the other electronic suppliers. People that we could look up to was mainly Dick Smith at the time through his advertising and catalogues. Yeah, he was a very big self-promoter. Dick Smith clearly, and look, there were others too, but you know, his is obviously the, most, the easiest to remember. Because Dick Smith was an electronics enthusiast himself from an early age and also an amateur radio operator, you know, you could trust someone like that. Hobby electronics really uh, changed fundamentally when Dick Smith came along. When Dick Smith started to get into Top Gear, he introduced a lot of innovation, new ideas, new life into the, the electronics hobbyist industry. Dick Smith Electronics, that was the mecca of electronic parts. He was, well, he just naturally cottoned on to this idea of selling uh, hobby electronics. I revolutionised it because I said, we're just going to have self-service. That was a revelation, self-service electronics. And he spent money on marketing, which was absolutely revolutionary. Other hobby shops just didn't do that. Dick felt that any publicity is good publicity for Dick Smith Electronics, and he loved publicity anyway. Well, Dick Smith was an excellent prankster and also an excellent marketer and had ideas that were unheard of anywhere else. But he promoted himself extremely well in Sydney and that's why his stores just absolutely boomed in Sydney. He got millions of dollars worth of free publicity by just doing what he does well and the media love him. The media love him. Dick Smith first opened and put all the components on display. Well, that, was, that was just incredible. You could, you could walk in and have a look to see what they had. It was Dick Smith and the other places, which were pretty boring, I suppose, to the average young enthusiast. He had the kits, of course, and then to go with the kits were the separate Funway books. It was certainly this, the first collection of kits that had been done with a book. Conway Volumes 1, 2 and 3, I think I did pretty much every project in all of those. So that was another marketing piece of genius from Dick Smith. And naturally you would associate Dick Smith with anything electronics at the time. Making electronics fun was all the rage back in those days. It's, it's what you did to get people to buy your particular kit, be it a, a Dick Smith Funway kit or a Tandy 50-in-1 kit. With Dick Smith he had uh, stores out in the suburbs so it's only a push bike right away. It was all bins and, and parts. They weren't full of sub-assemblies or junk parts like the surplus shops. They were full of bagged and tagged components. His stores were very successful because he had this self-service approach. There were a lot of components on display, that sort of thing, where people used to go. It was basically a self-serve operation, and that was another revolution. And instead of having the resistors out the back and the P1 pugs, I had them all in bins, and you just picked them up yourself, and you'd go and uh, line up and pay. Well, I definitely, you know, things like Dick Smith and Tandy Stores in those days were a mecca for electronics nerds. I mean, you'd walk in there and they literally catered for you. I mean, there was just drawers of parts. That was the bottom line. They were full of components. People could go and select their own components and they could see the vast range that was available. And it was good because you often didn't quite know what you wanted and you didn't quite know what it looked like. You, you could read the resistor colour code and everything and you knew what, what it was. Particularly Dick Smith, anything you wanted to do or needed to do, you could go down there and you could buy the part. It was stocked, it was easy, it was accessible. There was stuff that generally had an understanding of electronics at the time and you could go in and make your problems uh, go away by buying the parts that you needed. It really was a fun place as a child and enthusiast, even as an adult, to walk around and be inspired by the parts and kits and things that you could get. It was so pivotal in, in establishing both the access but also the sense of community that went along with it, you know, that you weren't just some <laughs> you know, kind of guy uh, holed up in his room. And he 
had the management ability to have more than one shop. The stores seemed like they were everywhere. The stores were everywhere and, and it was just a real buzz. It was actually busy on a Saturday morning. You'd go in there and you'd fight your way to the counter because everybody else was on the shelf stocking up with parts and bits and, and kits and things and it, it was just really fantastic feeling. Oh yes, yes. There was places in the city where you couldn't, on a Saturday morning, uh, you couldn't move in there. There were so many people wanting products, wanting latest components, latest electronics. When I change the, sh the car radio premises into a, uh, a self-service shop, I'm going to do a million dollars a year in the first year. I did. And I used to go up to work on the Saturday morning and I'd get there at 9 o'clock and there would be a 100 people waiting to get in. And that was really the place that you went for parts. Back then it was, it was that sense of access, you know, it's, it's like a little smorgasbord. You walk in, grab what you needed, walk up to the counter, you know, pay and then go home and start putting it together. It was so popular to have good service. Just about every weekend I used to catch a train down to, I think it was Burnley Railway Station and then a bus to the Dick Smith Richmond and that was my weekly mecca and I used to go down there and just look at all of the parts. The thing that made Dick Smith different to everybody else is that he produced a catalogue. One of the highlights of my year was around April every year when we would get the new Dick Smith Electronics catalogue in the mail. I used to pretty much memorise the entire Dick Smith manual every year. Now I just copied it, I'd looked on magazines from overseas and saw that Tandy in the United States was selling components that way so I thought I'd copy them. By producing a catalogue, people could spend all of their time saying, oh, do I buy this or do I buy that, and how much is this and how much is that? I really only need this, so I'll buy that. And you write out your little list on the back of an envelope and you go in and you get served. And we do exactly that in J-Car Electronics, just like they did in Dick Smith Electronics. But that catalogue really was a lifeline. We loved it, we looked after it. We read it from page to page, it had a fabulous data section in the back where you could look up basic electronics theory and how to use parts, it had all the radio repeater frequencies. It was everything to us at the time. The overwhelming mental picture I have in, is essentially of kind of plastic bins and parts and, and lettering and numbers and you know catalogues, big thick catalogues and walking up and down aisles trying to find the bit that you needed. And I think it was very much like that, you just had this just tons of electronic stuff and soldering irons and things, you just see all these things you never even knew, you know, that, that existed. But funnily enough, you go there to, to get one thing and then you'd, you'd end up just checking that bin over there and this one over there and just, just to see if there's uh, something interesting and you, know, you might pick that up just in case you needed it. That's, that's called impulse buying. I guess you would understand that today as a retail experience, you know, a, a kind of high touch retail experience applied to geeks, if you like. That you could buy individually, one at a time, exactly what you wanted. Especially compared to today, compared to, you know, finished goods, consuming electronics, there was almost nothing. Each, each store had its own flavour. If you went to, um, to a Dick Smith or Tandy, it tend to be more projects in little bags uh, on the wall, or um, they might have a, a, a TRS-80 sort of sitting in the shelves in the middle, you could go up and sort of play a little uh, uh, games, demonstration games they had on them. But there was also other sorts of stores, like in the, in the city, there was like Rod Irving, and I think it was Altronics. Some of them would almost be like, a bit like an op shop, where you sort of had these benches of boxes of parts, and you'd, you'd have to trawl through them, and you'd have to know what you're doing to, to be able to identify the, the parts and know where they were. Even though the local Dick Smith store might have only been, you know, a short bus ride away, or something, I would make the pilgrimage into what was called uh, Silicon Alley back then, which was York Street in uh, Sydney, which had all of the major players there. Uh, David Reed, Electronics, Tandy, Dick Smith, J Carr were all in that one little, they're all literally right next to each other. So I'd make the pilgrimage, I'd jump on the train and I'd ride it into the city. I was only like 10 or 11 or something like that. And I would ride into York Street and you'd just spend all day hopping between these shops and it was just, oh, it was heaven for an electronics hobbyist back then, really. Bargain grab bags are great. I used to go down and do things like buy 50 of every single value of resistor just so that I'd have them. You just know from your experience that when you're working on something, you don't have to stop and go and buy, buy a PC or you know, you'll, you'll buy two or something or you'll, you'll keep them around just, just for a rainy day or just in case you need them. Oh, you'd often, you'd often, well, things were cheap, you'd often say, oh, you know, I, I might use that. A collector mentality or that mag magpie mentality coming in again. Yeah, you often ended up with a lot of stuff that you didn't need, but it was all reasonably cheap and eventually you'll use it. The Tandy stores back then, it was all about the components. You would walk in, they'd have the components behind the counter, they would then they'd have racks, they'd have surplus bins. We had a Tandy electronics store in our town, although the problem is you'd look at you know the shelf and you'd have one resistor and a bubble pack for like $7, so it wasn't really 
the place you could buy stuff from. Dick Smith was the main one. That's where everybody headed. Tandy, you went to if... You know, you may not be able to get it at Dick Smith, but usually you could. But if they ran out of stock, then you'd run off down to the road to the Tandy store and, and pay twice as much. Tandy still sold the individual components. You could buy two resistors in a packet. Oh, for, you know, a dollar. It was it was crazy. You might buy a cable or something. It was very nice quality stuff, but it was just you know, ridiculous expensive. Each store had its own character and it had its own sort of set of parts. And you'd get to learn which store you go to to get which parts. And sometimes you have to go to three stores to get the various parts to make up your project. So it was all... I guess all part of the, uh, the learning experience. In Australia at the time, Dick Smith was the figurehead for electronics enthusiasts from the, the early 70s right through to the late 80s at least. Due to his fact he was associated with the advertising, it was the natural thought, I need something, I'll contact Dick Smith Electronics to grab it from them. There was a thirst. It was almost all of his spare pocket money in the early days was spent on buying the parts. They weren't exorbitant. Even the manufacturers, were, there was no this $100 minimum things. If you really needed bits, everyone was prepared to supply. I found I had no trouble buying almost everything I needed. And it was, it was sort of just a, a, a brilliant era. I think it was. I think the heyday of the 1970s was the absolute peak because you were able to buy all the most advanced components, uh, integrated circuits, and then of course the chips came in for computers and you could build something yourself because it wasn't available. Well, in that era there was such a cross-section of people, free thinking, incredible knowledge and, and not, not afraid to try different things.